Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've been in virtual mode now for almost exactly a year, and we've been done covered a wide range of things, pretty much the same range of things as we were covering in the real world. What we have been looking at uh, is obviously fintech and technology in general, and I'm delighted that this time we're able to look at an aspect of technology and of the techno world that we haven't really ever tackled before. Um, my colleague Leighton Hughes and I have as our guest for today, uh, the chairman of UK finance, Bob Wigley, Robert Wigley, who has recently, very recently, published a book called Born Digital, uh, the story of a, and I quote, distracted generation. Um, it's a book in three parts. The first part is overwhelming to me. It was a discussion of just how split generations in this country are. He is focusing on Generation Z, Gen Z, Gen Z, call it what you will, which are basically uh, people who are born, and I've forgotten what the exact the exact uh, dates are, but you, if you're born in, uh, I think, the late, late 1980s through to uh, when? No, it's <laughs> basically under under 25s apart from under the youngest. 25 at this point. Uh, yeah. After that, it's millennials. But from Gen Z to millennials to the generation that uh, many of our, many of the people who work for the CSFI are, uh, which is in their late 20s, early 30s, there's a big gap. And then, of course, to my generation or to, to Bob's generation, there's an even bigger gap. We don't even really speak the same techno language. Um, and much more important, there are huge differences in how we get our news, how we interact, how we socialize, how we view the world. Where, and it seems to me, and it seemed to me for some time, but this book really crystallized it. Each cohort, each age cohort now lives in, almost in a separate box with its own language, its own media, its own methods of interaction, its own rules and regulations. And it hadn't really been brought home to me as strongly as in this book written by somebody who is, after all, a banker. Bob is the chairman of UK Finance. He's the chairman of Vesta Glo Global Holdings. He's the chairman of Bing. He's uh, a, a non-executive director in a whole range of uh, other companies, both in the public and the voluntary sector. And he is himself an entrepreneur. He's also a former chairman of Victoria Beckham Limited, a former executive director of the Royal Mail, a member of the Bank of England's core, deputy chairman of business in the community, the chair of, and of course, where we know him, the chair of Merrill Lynch Europe, Middle East and Africa, from which position he stepped down after the great financial crisis in 2009, when Merrill was bought by Bank of America. He's also obviously very active in the voluntary sector. He's an, an officer of the Order of St. John's, which amongst other things runs the St. John's Ambulance uh, Service, and he is now, uh, I think, an important author. The second part of the book is, to my mind, <clears throat> as an elderly, as an oldie, rather less interesting. It's a sort of peon of praise to gener Generation Z, uh, particularly on their authenticity. If I ever hear this word authenticity again, I feel I'll shoot myself. But the third part of the book is interesting because that is where he talks about the need to regulate and how we should handle this uh, enormous uh, explosion of social media that uh, he, he's discussing in the first third of the book. My colleague, Leighton Hughes, as I say, has uh, his own thoughts on this, but the most important person is Bob Wigley himself. Tell us about the book, how you came to write it, and what are the main takeaways that you would like us to abstract from that book? Andrew, well, thank, thank you. Well, thank you so much for that very kind and generous introduction to start with. Um, probably worth just explaining why someone who has been a banker and I would say a capitalist uh, supporting free markets for most of my life has written a book which uh, has as one of its primary conclusions that we need to regulate more um, because that's an interesting question in itself. So 
I guess I watched my own three adolescent children growing up using technology in a different way from the way I use it. And that started me wondering about how that that uh, was affecting the formation of their personalities and the way that they saw the world. And about two years ago, I decided to meet a young entrepreneur every day for two years, every business day for two years. And I've now met over 200. And those meetings, which, by the way, were pretty much always the best hour of every day, um, crystallized my thinking that this Generation Z, as we call it, is very, very different from my generation in the way that it lives its life, sees the world, and that perhaps people in my generation, some of them don't haven't joined up the dots, haven't really realized that not only has technology changed their, their perceptions massively, but the whole range of societal factors which have changed in parallel. And I'm thinking here of things like the decline of marriage, the decline of religion, uh, the decline of things like communal eating um, uh, have changed so dramatically alongside this change in technology that when you put this all together, the, 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 the effect on the future is enormous. So that's really what the book is about. And my conclusion really is that um, the big tech companies and the devices and apps that they sell um, consume the world's collective attention in pursuit of making money. And I would argue that they haven't got the balance right between making money and doing societal good. Uh, and I believe that we can go so far as to say that society as a whole, and particularly Gen Z or Gen Z, is distracted and that, that our attention has been what I call uh, neurologically hijacked by this tsunami of weapons of mass distraction. Um, and I think that we know 71% of parents say they're, they're worried about their children spending too much time on screens. Um, and I know I have been during my own parenthood. But if writing this book has taught me one thing, it, it is, uh, no, it's not about screen time. It's what, what adolescents are doing while they're on screen that's important. As I say, all screen time is not equal. And all users are not equal. Uh, and in particular, children and the vulnerable are not equal to others. Um, but the one thing we can't ignore is that during the last 10 years, rates of adolescent well-being, happiness, loneliness, unhappiness, actually loneliness, depression, anxiety, sadly, self-harm and ultimately suicide have gone up by a factor at the same, during the same decade when these technologies have become ubiquitous. Now, that led me to go and look at the academic research to see whether there is a, a proven causal link between the two. And the answer is there actually isn't. Um, but I don't believe that those two things happening over the same decade can be a coincidence. So one of the things I'd like to see, and we'll come back to this at the end, is I'd like to see the big tech platforms cooperate more with academia and civil society to actually determine what are the, the, the aspects of social media that may, may cause uh, negative uh, influences on this young generation. A couple of statistics I'd just like to draw out. Um, YouGov found, even this was even pre-COVID, that three quarters of 16 to 24 year olds believe that their generation will be worse off in terms of happiness and mental health than preceding generations. I think that's quite a staggering statistic. And there's a very interesting annual survey which the Children's Society undertakes where they look at the level of happiness and unhappiness in children in this country amongst 10 to 15 year olds. They found that happiness is, is again, this was just pre-COVID, come back to the effect of COVID in a minute, that just pre-COVID, um, happiness is now at a, a, its lowest level for 25 years amongst UK children, uh, that actually UK 15 year olds are the saddest and least satisfied in Europe. And mm. that even the degree of unhappiness in friendships is in decline. So again, I think they're they're quite staggering statistics. A couple more, and, and I'll stop talking stats. Well, just let me ask you about that, though. You say the the least happy in Europe. Are you suggesting that we have higher um, density, as it were, of social media than than the rest of Europe, or is no. that specific to the no. UK? No, the Children's Society report does uh, definitely point the finger at social media. Um, and it believes that um, frequent social media use is one of the important factors that's driving this unhappiness. But, but I don't think that it's saying that uh, children in this country use social media more than they do anywhere else. And that's the reason. Uh, it's just for, there may be a whole host of reasons. It may be some of these other societal factors I mentioned.
The other the other stats that I just wanted to pick up was, was the following that that children generally are getting access to technology earlier uh, than they were in previous generations, and they're spending more time on them. A couple of quick ones. 30% of babies under one now watch 90 minutes of screen time a day, and 65% of one to two-year-olds watch more than two hours a day. And 42% of under eight-year-olds have their own tablet. Now, the issue with that is multifold. The first one is that think about the old situation where you might be standing by your baby's pram and you would be conversing with the baby and you might pick the baby up and you'd be bonding and you'd be looking at each other. And there's a very, very important sort of biological process going on there. Imagine now that your baby uh, or young child has a screen and that you are doing your emails on your BlackBerry or your iPhone. And just think about how that interrupts that process of social bonding and socialization that's such a basic element in a parent-child relationship, then extrapolate that forward to when the child is a little little older. They've now maybe got uh, their own iPad or laptop. They've got a gaming console. They've got a mobile phone. You are on your multiple devices. And think about the impact that's having on what we call cyber socialization. So in other words, whereas we grew up in the offline world, these children are growing up very much in a mix of the on and offline, but with a focus on the online. And I do think we need to think about that. One of the reasons is, um, it was put so brilliantly, I think, by Mary Aiken, who's one of the leading cyber psychologists in the world. She said, when, when I was growing up, um, if I wanted to play outside the house or go down to the high street, I had to have someone to supervise me or an elder brother to look after me. Now what happens is our children go up into their bedrooms and they forage off into the internet, which I would argue is potentially far more dangerous than the back garden or the high street. And yet we we have no idea what they're doing and we don't protect them. So in effect, we're sort of looking the other way while this erosion of childhood is, is going on. And I do think that's a cause of great concern. We access the internet typically from a safe place, the house. But the internet itself is not safe or may not be safe. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a really important uh, I'll probably stop talking now because I'm sure you've got lots of questions and we can get into what are the uh, what, what can we do about this? What could the big techs do about it? What parents can do? What educators can do? What governments can do? But that's really the kind of key key um, message behind the book is let's get into this, understand what's going on and think about how to protect um, our children. Yeah, let me, let me point one thing out. My generation uh, was encouraged to go and play outside and nobody supervised them. You were just shoved out the door at eight eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and you maybe came back at five o'clock. Your generation and Mary Aiken's generation was supervised, but still played outside. Now everybody comes back, but they're playing in this wider world, which in your opinion is extraordinarily dangerous. I mean, can I ask you this question? Do you feel that your ability to understand your children is more difficult or you know, it is more difficult for your generation to understand your children than it has been for any other generation to understand its children. Is this a unique problem or is this something that happens every time uh, there's a generation of 20 or 30 years? Well, I, I think it is incredibly difficult for the following reason that, I mean, I'll give you another little statistic that I loved when I was writing the book. Um, 54% of adolescents say that if, if their parents knew what really went on on social media, they'd be a lot more worried than they are. Um, now, I don't yeah, think but my because, parents, because my because, parents had known what I was up to when I was outside, they would have been extremely worried as well. I mean, again, I want to find out whether there's a qualitative change, whether, the, in your opinion, there's been a qualitative change in the relationship between children and parents, and whether children are, in some sense, more at risk or more divorced from uh, from from their parents' value structure. I think they are because I don't. But let's take bullying, for example. You could be bullied at school, but pretty much when you left the playground, that was the end of bullying time because the bully couldn't follow you home. Now, bullying can happen at any hour of the day or night, and very often does happen late at night. Take um, child grooming, same applies. If, if um, you know someone, as it were, dodgy was hanging around outside the school playground, they might well be spotted. On the internet, much harder to identify. So I, I do think it is a multiple factor more dangerous, not for all children, um, but definitely the risks are there. And to give you a horrendous statistic, I think I read, um, I'd have to find the statistic, but I think I read that um, 20% of uh, 
primary and 30% of secondary children have videoed live online with someone they don't know and 5% of them have been asked to undress. I don't think you would say that was a risk that you faced in your childhood, and I certainly didn't in mine. Hmm. Okay, let uh, let me ask uh, Leighton. Leighton is very concerned about the, the concept of online harms, which uh, he, he genuinely uh, shares your concerns about. Leighton. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how you think the, um, the, what form the online harms bill should take. Um, it's expected to finally come to fruition this year. Um, and is that enough to um, really moderate and police uh, and regulate what's going on in, in, these, in this space? So I think, first of all, to say that the UK government does deserve um, a lot of credit for bringing forward not just the online harms bill, but because it's part of a suite of um, legislation. I'll, do, I'll go into the other elements of it in a minute. So I think first first thing to say, well done to the government for adopting this, this um, objective of making the UK the safest place to go online in the world, and for actually doing something genuinely groundbreaking in a world context about it. So to explain what they are doing, for those who aren't familiar with the online harms bill, which is going through Parliament this year, this will, for the first time uh, in the UK, and indeed, I think just about anywhere in the world, impose a statutory duty of care on big tech platforms to assess what damage or harms their platforms and apps and services might be causing, particularly to youngsters, and then to take action to mitigate those harms. And Ofcom will have the job of assessing whether the actions taken to mitigate the harms, uh, and indeed the assessment of the harms in the first place, was, was accurate and sufficient. And if not, will have the right to fine these companies and possibly even in two years' time to take action against senior executives. So that, I think, is a, is a major step forward, will be a major step forward, subject to Ofcom, of course, being robust about its enforcement. It's part, though, of a wider suite of legislation, which is very interesting. So the second aspect is something which already exists, which is called, but is recent, which is called the Age Appropriate Design Code. This is a separate um, uh, code, which, which will require the big tech platforms to think very specifically in the context of minors about what content um, people might have access to when they're online. And then, and then again, think about whether it's uh, age appropriate and if not, take steps to make sure that it is. So that's, that's a second good step. The third step is to introduce into the national curriculum um, a relationship education uh, course, which is now compulsory. Now, I personally would have gone further than this and insisted that we had a, a module on uh, uh, responsible internet use but at least this first module is good because for the first time it will explain to children the difference between an online and an offline relationship and the particular risks that come with an online relationship. And then the fourth part of the legislation is the creation of the Digital Markets Unit at the Competitions and Markets Authority, where for the first time the CMA will be able to specifically prepare a code looking at um, the, as in inverted commas, monopolistic behaviours of some of these platforms and requiring them to adapt their behavior. So when you put it all together, this is genuinely um, world-leading legislation. It deserves credit. I could come back to some areas where I think it falls short. Okay, but is it is there a danger that it will become authoritarian and illiberal and that it will be uh, captured by, um, by a particular worldview and will actually narrow the ranges of choice that are open to adults and and adolescents and children that probably they 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 need they need at least the right to roam in a in a forest maybe uh maybe you need to put a wall around the forest but they still need the right to roam don't they and there is a danger that this will become narrow increasingly narrowly prescriptive um yeah i don't i'm afraid i don't buy that argument i think it's way too open at the moment um, and so I think some some narrowing of, of that freedom is necessary in, in the interest of safeguarding children. Um, I think that you know all these debates are always, aren't they, a balance between liberty, freedom, uh, right, the right to free speech, the right to access information on the one hand, and protecting minors on the other. And I don't think today we've got the right balance, and we need to, we need to move more in the direction of protecting children. But there is a danger. You would recognise there is a danger that in that you that people may use the uh, perfectly commendable goal of protecting children to impose their own political views. 
uh, of what is acceptable for anyone, uh, adult or child, to hear or to uh, to be exposed to. Well, two two points I'd like to make to that, Andrew. The first is that um, the government is not prescribing uh, what can and cannot be included in what's age appropriate. What they're saying is that each platform and each app designer has to have regard to that in what it includes in its offering. So there will be a, a multiplicity of approaches from different companies and, and different platforms and different app designers. Okay, So it's not the government imposing an absolute standard. It's saying these are criteria you must take into account. So it's not imposing its view of anything, number one. Number two, um, if you wanted to come at it from the other angle of um, the whole question of the existence of echo chambers and filter bubbles, mm -hmm. today the algorithms of the social media platforms have become very good at delivering us what we want to read. Um, and I would argue there's an equally big issue there about us getting stuck in our own uh, echo chamber as individuals. And one of the startling quotes in my book is from a, a, a young 20-year-old uh, graduate who said to me, I find it almost impossible to have a sensible debate with anybody at university on a political subject these days, because when I sit down with them, they've seen different news from the news I've seen, and we can't even agree about the basic facts. So if you can't agree about the basic facts, how can you then into, enter into a sensible philosophical debate? So I don't think your authoritarian issue is an issue. It might be an issue in some regimes, uh, you know, in, in the Far East or indeed the north of Europe, I could think of a couple of places where that might be a problem, but I don't think it's a problem in the UK or likely to be one. I was very interested by that same quote that you've just you've just given there, because it, it struck me that this is completely new and that um, one's worldview is personally curated, uh, not necessarily by you, by an algorithm, such that the worldview that you, I mean, assuming you were a, a, a Gen Z or a millennial, your, the, the worldview that you would have through all your uh, news feeds on social media is very much your worldview. It differs from Leighton's worldview. It differs from somebody else's worldview. And you don't have that ability to, uh, to, to discuss and to argue and to, you know, to, to come to some sort of compromise view. I mean, Leighton, can I ask you whether you have noticed that? Because it, it's an important part of the argument, I think, in the book. Yeah, it's, it's a real problem today. Um, these siloed um, political views... Um, different sources of news. And I think on different social media, well, I think more and more people have get their news from social media and it's completely curated to your own personal experience. Where do you get your news from? I get my news from the Financial Times. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this was, an, I think early in the book, you had some amazing statistics on where people actually do pick up their news from in these these age cohorts, millennials and Gen Zs. And it isn't the news as I know it. It probably isn't the news as you know it either. Uh, I mean, Bob. Just well, the, 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 short, the short answer to that is that Facebook is now the biggest news source of news feed in the world. I mean, Punto, that's, that is one of the reasons that what's been happening in Australia recently has been happening. The Australian government decided it had to take um, Facebook to task and to force it to pay what you would call, I think, traditional news sources, uh, something for the content that Facebook distributes on the basis that if it didn't, those, those uh, in inverted commas, unbiased traditional news sources, independent journalistic news sources might disappear altogether and that that wasn't in the national interest. So that's been a very interesting debate raging in, in Australia. Um, the thing you might have said to me is, is this any different from, you know, if, if you were a socialist you reading the guardian or if you were a tory you reading the telegraph well the answer is it is a bit different because in addition to reading those newspapers you'd still have the bbc itv news you'd have the economist you'd have the financial times you'd have endless different news sources if if one company suddenly uh, is the majority news provider in the world just put it in this context and by the way which has led to some people calling these companies sovereign companies can you imagine that if Facebook was 100% owned by Russia, we would allow that company to be the biggest um, provider of news in the world? And yet, because it's a private company, it's somehow okay. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that its uh, chief executive would personally seek to try and influence people's news. But I just can't imagine that happening in a, in a country context, whereas it seems to have happened in a company context. And that seems to be very bizarre. But 
Facebook isn't a provider of news, it's a platform for news. Now, I realize that this is this is going to be adjudicated in the courts, but what it, what it really does is curate other people's views and then targets them to a, an individual audience. I assume that's how it that's how it operates, and it it makes it immensely powerful. But should should actually uh, Facebook itself develop the kind of news uh, facility that the BBC or some some other news gathering information uh, company has, or uh, is it should it remain a platform? Should should we have more competition? Do we disapprove of curating to a personal? Uh, to a personal uh, taste, I'm saying. Well, I think I think the questions that that academia and civil civil society raise about this is we don't know how the algorithm works. Um, Leighton has already observed that he gets different news from his friends, and that's because we believe the algorithm tends to feed us the kind of news that we read, so it becomes self reinforcing, and that's that's why you you have this concept of an echo chamber or a filter bubble. Um, it, it's not for me to decide whether that's good or bad. I think it is for for us all to ask. Um, whether it's good or bad, and to understand how it works. And we don't have transparency over that today. Mm. I mean, that's clearly, transparency is clearly a big issue as far as you're concerned. Is there any way to to take the lid off and actually to look at the algorithms and to, to, to monitor the algorithms and perhaps to regulate the algorithms? Well, so interestingly, Facebook, as you know, has set up something called the Facebook Oversight Board, um, which is going to have some role um, as set out by Facebook in guiding its what's called its content moderation policies. So, so at the heart of this is a piece of US legislation which exempts uh, Facebook and indeed other big platforms from the requirement to be a publisher. In other words, they don't have to take responsibility for content on their platform posted by users, um, which of course is in stark contrast to traditional media outlets. Okay, so that's where it all starts. Now, then the question people raise is, well, should they have some responsibility for that? And interestingly, just before the uh, last presidential election, uh, the Attorney General in in America um, sent a clause to the the Congress uh, suggesting that Section 230, which is the piece of legislation which grants this shield or exemption, should be substantially repealed and that these companies should have more responsibility for content moderation. So that that debate is live and raging. And your view? Um, I think it should. Now, interestingly, uh, the the UN uh, is leading um, a charge on this. Uh, The Secretary General has appointed a tech envoy. There's something called a high-level panel, which is looking at a whole load of issues, but one of the big ones is whether there shouldn't be some uh, global cooperation around the subject of content moderation, uh, moderation. It is a massively complicated subject. We could spend the whole hour talking about it. But in my view, I think we do need to understand more about how the uh, how these algorithms work and the effect that it has on political discourse, because the risks uh, are obviously huge. Yeah, as as a sixties, as an aging sixties liberal, you know, I, I I worry about that because it seems to me to take. Uh, as in the wrong direction. I, anything which has a UN uh, body pushing it, I'm inclined to think, is going to be dominated by authoritarian regimes, and uh, it's going to take out an awful lot of the content that libertarians really rather like. Well, the irony is, Andrew, today the opposite is the case, because all the bodies that govern the internet are dominated um, by a very small number of countries, some would argue a too small list of countries, uh, and indeed are, are uh, heavily influenced by the US. One of the reasons these bodies haven't been effective is because they haven't had enough members from other countries like Russia, China, and elsewhere, who now are in India, who now argue that since these bodies um, don't have enough of their representatives, they wish to separate their internet, creating this potential for what we call splinternet or fragnet. And we could end up with four different internets, one in China, one in uh, India, one in Russia, and one in the rest of the world. Well, if the Chinese wish to have their own internet, that's fine. But I don't want to have the Chinese internet imposed on me. Uh, so there's a, there may be a difference there. I mean, can can I go back to one of the, one of the things that um, that you raised at the very beginning, which was the sort of anomie or the, the depression that's associated with modern youth? I have been very concerned. I have a very very small staff, but Leighton is a large part of it, and I've been very worried about the social impact of COVID 
and of the lockdown on younger people, uh, throwing them very much on their own devices, literally on their own devices, into the internet world and the damage that that does. Can I ask Leighton a little bit, you know, uh, how have you coped during the, the lockdown and has your reliance on social media as an alternative for, form of social interaction increased? And if so, do you feel that that's good or bad? So I, yeah, it's something that I've really, I grappled with from the very beginning. Um, and it was, a, it was just after having read um, Jared Lehner's, um, I think, 10 reasons to quit the internet or something. And I was actively, or social media, I think. And I, I was actively pursuing that, <laughs> trying to wean myself off of it. And then COVID happened and I had no choice, really, because you can't see your friends and fa or, or your family. And so you really do compensate with, um, you know, Zoom calls, WhatsApp, more focus on Instagram. And yeah, it, it felt like a step back actually for me. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it has enabled me to keep in touch with people. And that's a great thing. But I think it's that lack of a hybrid, which is disturbing. Um, and to that, that's sort of my main takeaway, really. What, what do you feel has been the impact of COVID? Because you wrote the book. It, it Obviously, it, it references the forthcoming American election. Therefore, I assume you kind of uh, signed off on it somewhere probably around October last year. Um, exactly. What, what, so so we were partway into COVID. And I do think that um, uh, Leighton puts it very well. COVID sort of caused us somewhat to recalibrate our attitude to technology because we couldn't physically meet people. We We had to use technology. And for youngsters in particular, it was their only way of connecting. And it was a very important thing. Um, but, I, but, I, but hopefully, as we go back to whatever the, you know, the new normal is, um, uh, we, can, we can go back to looking at how it was before COVID and saying, you know, is this reliance on technology good? And as you know, because you read the book, one of the themes in my book is that um, technology, whether intentionally or otherwise, systematically attacks a lot of the places that during my uh, growing up, um, uh, empathy developed, whether it be face-to-face -face conversation, uh, whether it be social time, playtime, politicking, communal eating, devices ever present interrupt that process. And that does concern me. And, it, and I think it's one potential reason why society is um, so polarized. It takes us back, however, to the introduction of television dinners in America, which uh, one heard exactly the same arguments that people were sitting in front of the box instead of sitting around the table. Well, what one did, but one then has to look at the, the, the number of hours in a day that the average person spent or spends on a TV and how much they spend on screens in total. And the amount of time, even at the peak, that we spent on TV is nowhere near what we all spend on screens when you add up your mobile phone, your laptop, your gaming console, you know, and so on. So you can't compare the two. You also need to be very careful in that context to think about the um, advertising controls because TV advertising is heavily regulated. Um, and you know, one statistic I've seen, which I think is reasonably reliable, is that the amount of advertising on social media is 10 to 20 times that allowed on television. So if you're spending you know, 9 to 11 hours a day on screen time in total, you're, you're subject to a lot more advertising than you ever were, even at the peak on television. So it's a good point, but it's not a valid comparison. Is that, is that, one, uh, is that a point at which w an entry point for control of the big platforms to, uh, to impose the same kind of restrictions on advertising that we do have on, on terrestrial television? And I think it has to be. I think it has to be. I don't think we have any choice about that. Hmm. Leighton, you have a, a question. Yeah, it was, I, I found uh, one of, what well, a lot of, all of your book very interesting, uh, but I was one of the um, one of the points was on digital, um, you know, this combination of digital and physical uh, space and the blurring of boundaries. Um, I was wondering, David Solomon, uh, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, has said that he wants everyone back in the office. Um, is that how do you think that squares with Generation Z, Z, um, and? how do you think post-COVID recruitment might be in terms of um, attracting Generation Z? Yeah, so I think um, just as uh, Generation Z doesn't see uh, the distinction between the online and offline world in the way we did, because we had a time when there wasn't an online world, 
So I don't think they will see um, quite the same distinction between the workplace and the not workplace, if, if I can put it that way. So I think they will expect the work wherever they are, uh, traveling or at home, remotely working, as they do in the workplace. And um, I think the second thing is they will, they value um, freedom, flexibility, the ability to remote work, flexi time, you know, non-standard holiday times, paid time off. So um, I think if you're going to be a forward-looking company, whilst I totally understand why the chief executive of Goldman Sachs would say, I want people in the office at least some of the time, because it goes to uh, the creation of an organizational culture. It goes to uh, potentially the ability to have my staff work together in uh, creativity and innovation. I completely understand those drivers uh, as someone who's managed a big organization myself. But equally, I think if you're going to appeal to uh, the best talent amongst the youngsters, you're also need, going to need to run in parallel with that approach, the fe flexibility to not always be in the office and to have, as I said, flexi time and part-time working and, and remote working. So we are moving then to a hybrid system where, in a way, people will socialize in the office and work at home. Is that sort of uh, a little bit how it's going to be? look? Yes, I think that's exactly right, Andrew. Hmm. But you also have said that, um, I think somewhere in the book, you were talking about, you felt that productivity was actually not helped by the fact that people are on so many devices so much of the time, and that this actually distracts in a way from uh, from from the, the task in hand. Of course, if, if, you're, if you're on a, a Teams, a Microsoft Teams meeting or a Zoom call and you're working, uh, that's fine. If at the same time you're scrolling your social media or you're chit-chatting on Snapchat or uh, indeed there are times of the day when you're not on a Zoom and you're doing those things because you're, dis you know, in inverted commas, distracted by your devices, there must be an opportunity cost of distraction, as I put it in the book. And I did a little calculation which said that, I think I worked out that if 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 you assume that people were were distracted only half an hour of the average working week, and you're, instead of being distracted for that half an hour, they worked for that half an hour, and you'd have to make lots of other assumptions about you know the marginal productivity of that half an hour. But broadly speaking, if they did that, the GDP contribution would be getting on for fifty billion pounds. That, to put it in context, is the entire education budget or a third of last year's pre-COVID NHS budget. So, so the opportunity cost of distraction, that calculation may be looked by maybe wrong. And economists and mathematicians, you know, Tim Harford would have a field day, I'm sure. Um, but even if it's uh, you know an order of magnitude wrong, it's still a massive number. And therefore there is a significant uh, opportunity cost of distraction. That's clear. And frankly, the it could be wrong in the other direction and it could be much more damaging than that. And it would explain it, it, well, away uh, the Britain's productivity problem. Um, but there are, um, let me ask you the following question. How many social media platforms are you on or do you monitor? Um, in normal times, not many, because I deleted my Facebook account about a year you did ago. have a Facebook account. I had one, which I hardly used, and then I deleted it. Um, right. Okay, tell, tell us what else you, you, you've got. You um, haven't got very much on LinkedIn because I looked, but you're there. So LinkedIn is the only one I really use, and I, I call that the nice platform because so far it doesn't seem to have been invaded by some of the negative influences that, that one sees elsewhere. I don't use Instagram uh, uh, at all. Uh, I'm not on Twitter. I think from what I've seen of it, it is literally a cesspit of, of negativity. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big social media user. I have to tell you, it is impossible to write and launch a book without being on these platforms. So... In the course of, I'm obviously writing this book, I had to go onto the platforms to to at least be credible to say what I've said in the book. Uh, and you can't sell a book without being on these platforms. Over half the world's <laughs> books are now sold by Amazon. And you you do your book promotion, particularly in a COVID period, through social media. So I've had no choice but to go back onto the platforms for this limited period for the purpose of trying to promote the book. What? All right. So Leighton, you're a millennial. So what social media, and pla media platforms are you on? Um, I'm, I'm never quite sure whether you're on them or you you use them. What's whatever the word is. I'm I'm on um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, LinkedIn. Um, but as I say, I really is that all? Not TikTok. No, I mean, I'm just curious. Not TikTok um, because of a, of a political risk. Um, but I'm uh, I'm just yeah. I, I think I'm, I spend too much time on them. But it's um, 
I think because of COVID, as I mentioned earlier, I think I was on the verge of cancelling my fan Facebook account. And I just, I feel like there is an, uh, a reason to have it during this period. Um, and yeah, that's, I, I'm, pr I'm probably a very young millennial, by the way, I, or a very old uh, Gen, Gen Z, just uh, for clarification. I mean, I, I uh, people in your age cohort, are you typical of them? Uh, how much time would you say the average person in your age cohort with a, a decent education actually spends on all these social media platforms? Uh, are the numbers in, in Bob's book realistic to you? Yeah, they, they are. And I, I think um, the problem with a lot of this, of the time spent is that it's passive um, and you're not actually uh, engaging with anything. It's often just scrolling. Um, and that's, I think that's part of the addiction um, feature of these, of these uh, websites, you know, the serotonin boost that you get from clicking something or liking something. Um, I think a lot of time spent on Facebook and these apps and Instagram, I think particularly actually um, is quite damaging. Um, uh, well, Bob, you, I mean, you do talk uh, about the, the dopamine hits uh, that, that people get from looking at websites and, you know, to what extent is it genuinely addictive for opinion? Are they genuinely addictive? So um, if we can come come back specifically to the word addictive, because the, the tech platforms get very upset about that word because it has a particular medical meaning. Well, they call it, you know, dope. They call it dope for a reason. As yeah, in, um, Indeed, indeed. Um, but So I would prefer to call it either compulsive use or overuse, okay? But I don't think there's any doubt that these platforms are designed by neuroscientists, by probably the best neuroscientists in the world, to uh, harness the ability of dopamine to to attract our eyeballs back to these platforms again and again and to keep them there for as long as possible that is the whole basis of the business model of many of these platforms so i mean that's not in question it's not denied um frankly to be honest by the platforms themselves they admit it so it's it's built into them by design uh, whether it be the buzz the likes the uh, the the way a uh, you know, the particular color of an icon, the whole thing is thought through to be as attractive in inverted commas as possible. Um, and yes, um, what Leighton describes, I would call, um, you know, chill and scroll is a, is a very common activity for youngsters, particularly late at night. And we haven't, we haven't talked about the effects on sleep, where again, we could spend a whole hour, but late night use is prevalent. Um, it's extensive and it does affect the youngster's ability to sleep. We know from all the surveys, um, that the effect of blue light um, causes people issues with sleeping. And, and the reason we should be worried about that is our youngsters are drowsy, which then affects their education. And um, most of the world's sort of serious long-term illnesses have proven uh, links with deficient sleep. So we should be very focused on what uh, the World Health Organization called pre-COVID a global sleep uh, epidemic. Are you, uh, is there an upside or where would you put the upside? I mean, uh, of, of technology and social media. Yeah. Oh, yes. Look, my book is not making the argument that we should get rid of all technology. That would be ridiculous. It's, it's completely ubiquitous to our daily lives. And it has many, many positives, um, including giving us choice and convenience and efficiency. Uh, you know, so there are many, many advantages technology, and to, as I said, to to sort of suggest that it's all bad or we should get rid of it would be. We're not suggesting that the Internet of Things and all sorts of things like that are bad, but social media, the use of social media by young people, where is the upside in that? Um, well, I think there there is upside. So some of the surveys will tell you from that from Gen Z itself will tell you that in crises, sometimes social media has been helpful to them in giving them peer-to-peer -peer support. It's given them ideas about how to deal with situations. Mm -hmm. It's enabled them to, con to have contact with a parent in a, in a crisis. So, so, you know, there are upsides to social media platforms. Absolutely there are. Um, the, 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 the issue, I think, is educating youngsters on the balance of, of good and bad, and making sure they're aware of the risks so that they can become what I would call responsible internet users or digital citizens you know, in a fully informed way. That's it, rather than just come across it and find themselves subject to this compulsive use with all the negative influences they may not realize exist. But of so course, it's about balance. The problem is that um, 
they simply know so much more about the internet, about the social media platforms, about how to navigate them, how to get rid of or get round all sorts of controls than their parents or than their teachers. Uh, and won't that always be the case? Well, so to try and perhaps um, lead us into a conclusion on a positive note, the one thing I would say that was striking about my 200 meetings with young entrepreneurs during this two-year period was how many of them recognize that they are suffering from uh, digital overload. They do, they do understand some of the risks around the negativity of some social media and that they are taking steps themselves to um, either regulate their use or indeed in some cases to develop solutions uh, to digital overload. So, uh, for example, I was on a competition a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a young, uh, I think, 16-year-old from America called Maddie Freeman who set up a charity which takes uh, Movember, you know, this this idea that if you don't have a moustache, you grow one, or if you do, have you, you shave it off um, for charity, that we would have a no social media November instead. And you would literally take yourself off a platform for a month and detox and see what it did to you. And she did that because she had lost four friends in two years to suicide, which she put down, um, you know, at least in part to excessive social media use mm-hmm. and the negativity that came with it. And she wanted to do something about that. So that's just one example. But to, to be on a, on a positive, I do think Gen Z gets it, uh, at least some of Gen Z gets it. And they happily, because they are remarkably resilient, resourceful, positive, passionate youngsters, they are forging ahead with solutions. And you, having spoken to 200 of these entrepreneurs, I surmise have made investments in a few of them. Well, <laughs> in the process of, so so I'm working with one company in, in Switzerland at the moment that has a, I think, a genuinely world-leading new way of working out someone's age. This is very important in the context of the age-appropriate design code. One of, the, one of the things that the platforms will tell you it in their defense is it's very difficult to work out the difference between a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. And if the watershed you know, for particular applications is 13, as it typically is, that's quite important. Um, but by mixing together um, uh, the ability to see someone's face, to hear their voice, and to triangulate between the two on a dynamic basis, you can get up to a very high probability of being able to predict their age very accurately. And that is quite exciting. So, so that's one of the things I'm working on. Of course, the original selling point of the internet was that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, so I would argue that they should know you're a dog because that's actually what gives rise to a lot of the bad behavior, the fact that people don't know you are a dog. What uh, What is your schedule with this with the book? The book, book was published last, last week. You're now uh, going out on the, what's the word? The, the, the Well, I don't know what the internet equivalent of a stump is, but I think that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing a lot of these sessions, talking to as many people as we can about it trying to get people interested in this. I mean, people are fascinated by the subject. Every parent is worried about what their children's, child is doing on the internet pretty much. I'm, I'm definitely playing into a rich seam here. Um, and hopefully the book contains some useful ideas about what parents, educators and governments can do. Uh, and you are getting support from Westminster. I notice that you have MPs endorsing you. I mean, what is yes. the take up there? Uh, yes, well, happily the ex-Secretary uh, of State at DCMS, who, who authored the, the online harms bill, is one of the people who gives me a cover quote and is very supportive. Jeremy Wright has been incredibly helpful. Um, but there are a whole range of MPs who are interested in the subject and picking up on uh, on what's in the online harms bill, which will, I think, be very heavily scrutinized as it goes through Parliament to make sure it's really as effective as it can be. Okay, on that, I guess, optimistic note, can I thank you, Bob, Bob Wigley? Can I thank my colleague, Leighton Hughes? And can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks. Thank you for having me. It's been a really, really interesting conversation.